Hello and welcome to Newsweek. Today, we are joined by David Devdas, a journalist and the author of two books, The Story of Kashmir and A Generation of Rage in Kashmir, and someone who's tracked the issues on the ground closely for many years. Thank you, David, for joining us. David, Great to be here. Yeah, David, to begin with, uh, we know that the abolition of or revoca- repeal of Article 370 has been on the agenda of the BJP and the RSS for decades now. But nonetheless, how do you see the way this was actually enacted right now? The presidential order, the uh, uh, bills being passed in two days in parliament in a hurry, the repression on the ground. So how do you see this, the method in which it is done? Apparently, this plan has been in uh, place for a long time. Right. In fact, I'm told that even last year, mm-hmm. there was a move to possibly suspend the Yatra and do it at the same time right. last year, right. uh, which is a little strange, but perhaps it fits with the idea that they want to keep it secret. They wanted to uh, do a sort of, uh, to use the terminology that is common in the government, surgical strike. Right. Um, because nobody would have suspected mm-hmm. that they would suspend the Yatra mm-hmm. at uh, and do it at peaks, peak uh, tourist season right. uh, and the beginning of the apple season. So in terms of the economy of Kashmir, this is a very crucial time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yet, the this seems to have been the plan even last year right. and uh, certainly has been gone through with uh, this year. And the plan surely involved both secrecy and uh, getting it through the two houses of parliament right. at the end of the session very mm-hmm. quickly. In fact, the session was extended mm-hmm. for this to be uh, accomplished. Right. Now, of course, uh, this is in a sense day zero because on the one hand, a lot of administrative and uh, um, structural changes mm-hmm. will have to be done. The two union territories will have to be notified, right. lieutenant governors appointed, a new. is also brings into question the entire administrative setup because the KAS now also has right. to be reorganized mm-hmm. and the IAS cadre of the uh, Jammu and Kashmir state. Uh, will some of those officers go to this? Will the union territory cadre apply to these two union right. territories right. or be extended to? The new officers, if they come into this cadre, does it create a whole lot of uh, seniority problems or um, question marks? All of this will come into play. The other thing is that on the ground, people are by and large still in shock. Uh, They they didn't expect this. It came out of the blue. There's also very tight uh, um, security control. At some point, maybe, Mm -hmm. uh, this will play out in one way or another. And uh, so, this will have to be a long-term mm-hmm. uh, cautionary right. exercise right. Uh, in the future. Also, on the other hand, there is the international scenario. Mm-hmm. China is lined up quite closely with right. uh, Pakistan. Right. Also, President Trump mm-hmm. has been playing footsie, footsie with right. Uh, right. Pakistan. The Afghan situation mm-hmm. is in very, very sensitive transition. Right. The Taliban seem to be on the brink of taking over right. power there, mm-hmm. de facto, if not uh, formally. Mm-hmm. The Iran situation preoccupies the minds of a lot of people in the US, uh, right. real uh, power structure right. and uh, other parts of the world. And therefore, they are uh, prone to accommodating Pakistan mm-hmm. in order to uh, uh, contain right. Iran right. and Afghanistan. Right. On the other hand, the ground situation in terms of militancy mm-hmm. in Jammu and Kashmir, mm-hmm. in the Kashmir Valley, in South Kashmir in particular, mm-hmm. has been moving a little towards more radical mm-hmm. uh, groups. Right. The Ansar Ghazwatul uh, Hind has actually gained ground, ironically, after uh, the, its founder, Zakir Musa, was uh, killed a couple of months ago. Right. And uh, although the numbers are not very large, mm-hmm. the trend is important. Right. And the fact that pan-Islamism as an ideology mm-hmm. appears to be gaining ground over the last few years. Right. And uh, <clears throat> you studied the situation there for uh, over the decades right now, and you've written about it also. So the right-wing's narrative, of course, is that this means there are two laws in the country, 
and it's a, it's a method of division and all that. But as far as the people and the, say, especially the intellectual community, the leaders of Kashmir are concerned, how did, from your experience, how did, how important was 370 and its concrete manifestations to them? See, 370 has actually meant for many years mm -hmm. what to people, in people's minds, right. by and large, what actually 35A was about, right. which is, as far as Kashmiris in the valley are concerned, mm -hmm. a limitation on uh, anyone from outside the state being able to purchase land right. in uh, the state. Mm -hmm. This is what animated the very, very uh, heated uprising of 2008 mm -hmm. after land was sought to be transferred to the Sri Amarnath right. uh, Shrine Board. Right. This was the core issue in people's minds mm -hmm. in the valley. Right. In Jammu, very many young people in particular uh, cling to that idea of outsiders being excluded in terms of jobs. Mm -hmm. Over there, it's much more to do with jobs right. than with property. Right. Uh, among the people at large, this is how it's played out. Mm -hmm. Among the leaders mm -hmm. of, or let us say, the politicians who have held control of power mm -hmm. over the years, over the decades right. in uh, Kashmir, autonomy. Mm -hmm whatever it is, whatever form it has taken, right. has actually meant autonomy for the state government from the central government. Right. The fact is that under the rubric of autonomy, rights have actually not been transferred to the people. Right. This is correct. Mm -hmm. That in, in many ways, and the Home Minister made these points at length in the Lok Sabha on uh, Tuesday evening, but uh, the fact is that in terms of, for example, the uh, term of the assembly. It's six years rather than five years in the rest of the country. In terms of uh, the Right to Information Act, the way it was implemented there and the way it has been further watered down. Right. Of course, now it has been watered down in the rest it's of the, the country, country as well. Right. Uh, the, the way in which the Panchayati Raj uh, um, acts were implemented and uh, very little power was really transferred to the local bodies, panchayats right, in particular. Right. Now the government, the central government is talking of empowering the mm -hmm. panchayats uh, to a great extent. Let us see how that pl plays out. Right. Uh, what I would say is that at this point, there's a great challenge for the central government mm -hmm. because having taken on right. the onus, it's having turned the state into two union territories, right. which is quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, it has taken upon itself mm -hmm. the responsibility to deliver. Right. And uh, do you see that there is any prospect of, uh, say, the various negotiations that took place over the years? They were track, tree diplomacy, say, engagement with various sectors, even including the Hurriyat, for instance. So the Home Minister, of course, has now said that that won't happen. But do you see there's actually any possibility of dialogue with various sections of Kashmiri society on this? There certainly was, mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps still is, but the government is not interested. Right. That's quite clear. Right. The uh, Huriyat conference, at least sections of it, the Mirwais gave me an interview a few months before, maybe mm -hmm. s seven or eight months before right. uh, Burhan Wani was killed mm -hmm. in 2016. So at the end of 2015, the beginning of the winter of 1516, the Mirwais was almost pleading mm -hmm. for talks. Right. Let us please have talks. Right. Because he also saw that a new radicalism mm -hmm. was coming into militancy, the new militancy right. that had come into play. Uh, but there was no response. Right. After Burhan Wani was killed, MPs went in and with the assistance of the government right. were taken to the various uh, prominent leaders' homes. Mm -hmm. They were not able to talk because by that time, the joint resistance leadership had been formed right. and they were totally controlled by Pakistan by then. Right. This had happened by April 2016. Burhan was killed on July the 8th right. that year. Now, at over the last year or two, there have been fresh initiatives by others to try and build. And I am told that even Mr. Gilani was quite mm -hmm. willing to negotiate, to come down to right. some kind of solution with dignity mm -hmm. and some kind of right. uh, paradigm that would right. be that would accommodate mm -hmm. various kinds of mm -hmm. moves without taking a very hard line. Right. But clearly, the center was not interested. Right. 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 
and another aspect of your work has also been regarding the youth in Kashmir. So, about you, the book itself is called The Generation of Rage, about how there's been a shift in the way you think itself. So, how do you see the impact of this move on uh, young people in Kashmir? You see, over the last 30 years, mm -hmm. two generations right. have uh, not only grown up but been born mm -hmm. in a time of violence. Right. And so, they are the children of war. Right. They are angry, they are uh, traumatized from infancy mm -hmm. and they have also been, particularly the millennial generation born around the turn of the century, mm -hmm. have grown up at a time when they've heard about this uh, war on terror and global oppression of Muslims right. and what they see on the ground in terms of militarization mm -hmm. plugs into that right. and seems to confirm that. Right. And they see the world through that prism. Right. And so it's a much more pan-Islamist mm -hmm. uh, view of the world than before. Right. As it is, Salafi Islam tends to have become far more uh, the norm in Kashmir mm -hmm. uh, than Ziyarati Islam, as I refer to it. Some people call it Sufi Islam, but the, to my mind, that's a little different. But shrine-oriented uh, Islamic right. praxis right. is what was commonplace until the 90s. Right. And in fact, common people at large contested the Hizbul Mujahideen and the jamaat e islami which backed the Hizbul Mujahideen to a large extent, although not officially, through the 90s. Now, Salafi Islam has become more or less the standard. Right. And uh, people are not contesting it, by and mm -hmm. large. Mm -hmm. uh, people are, in fact, those who go to shrines mm -hmm. do it quite often covertly. They don't want to be seen. They don't want to be recognized right. doing that because it's seen as a deviation right. from standard practice. Right, right. That is how far we've come in the last 20 years or so. Uh, youth have also been alienated in various other ways. Mm -hmm. So there's not only this global perception of their situation, right. globalized perception, right. uh, but also a tremendous sense of disappointment. Mm -hmm. I think in the 2008 elections, mm -hmm. people were willing to try out almost for a last time, right. this democracy and the way it uh, was promised. 2014, there had been floods and in the wake of the floods, people came to the election booths hoping this time for at least some relief and rehabilitation and a lot of funds from the center. They were disappointed again. They were disappointed also with the PDP coming together with mm -hmm. what people on the ground saw as an RSS party, right. RSS right. backed party. Mm -hmm. And they saw this as a great jolt. But for the first few months, they were mm -hmm. still willing to uh, bide their time, hoping that at least funds would come and some kind of rehabilitation, right. development would take place. That right. didn't happen either. Right. Instead, during 2015, uh, there was one incident of, uh, of cow vigilantism mm -hmm. in Udampur, which had a tremendous impact in the valley. Right. Of course, news from other parts of the country was also coming in. So there was a greater sense of uh, dismay mm -hmm. at the coalition right. that was in place. Right. The coalition remained in place until last year, 2018, uh, June. After that, actually there was no response even in terms of protests and uh, hartals right. to the jailing of a whole lot of uh, Hurriyat and other freedom fighter right. leaders right. or leaders of various kinds of groups. Right. There was no response. Mm -hmm. Even when the jamaat e islami was banned mm -hmm. a few months ago, right. there was no response. People right. didn't protest. Mm -hmm. But perhaps this jolt may affect the, the, the faith that they had. Because even in, as I said before, the 2008 elections, a lot of people were looking at it almost as a last chance. Let's right. go out and vote and see. Let's hope something will be delivered. Right. They were disappointed. Right. There was a lot of callousness, unresponsiveness, <coughs> corruption. Corruption has been a major factor mm -hmm. in Kashmir. Right. And even over the last year or so, uh, the hope that at least corruption would be cured right. doesn't seem to have worked out because in the governor's press conference uh, just about a month ago, uh, that was a major issue that a lot of journalists brought up. Right. So there's been disappointment all around. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, sense of uh, dismay over both the global scenario right. and the way they see themselves within that uh, mm -hmm. backdrop right. as well as with how things have played out right. on the ground right. and the division of the state into two union territories mm -hmm. will most likely be seen as humiliating exactly. in right. terms of the Kashmiri sense of identity right. which is very strong right. I mean we know that there are many identities across the country that are very strong the Tamil identity the Bengali identity for example and several others in Kashmir there's a sense of great history going back thousands of years right. And a written history going to about 1100, written in about right. uh, 1100 uh, CE, and a sense of culture, a sense of uh, achievements in terms of theatre, in terms right. of medicine, in terms of uh, culinary uh, skills. This deep sense of identity may get a great toll. Right. Now, of course, there are many different identity groups within Jammu and Kashmir. Right. It's a many splendid right. place. In fact, I've argued over the years that this is perhaps the most sociologically complex place on earth, more so than the Balkans. Right. So dividing, I'm very glad that the government at least has chosen not to trifurcate because I was most concerned about the division along the Chenab uh, basin, right. uh, where in many areas the population is 50-50 or 60-40 right. Hindu-Muslim right. and uh, we do not want to disturb the degree of communal harmony that right. there is. And so happily they have chosen to not touch that at least. So Jammu and Kashmir remains mm -hmm. one entity, yeah. uh, Ladakh is separated both have been reduced to union territories. Mm -hmm. It seems from the Home Minister's statements in the Lok Sabha mm -hmm. and there are other indications that perhaps this move is a little bit of a bargaining chip. Right. In fact, the Home Minister virtually uh, made a declaration in the Lok Sabha, mm -hmm. if you behave yourselves, then right. we will give you back a state. <laughs> right. Which is again a little, right. um, is going to upset people in terms of uh, sense of humiliation. Right, exactly. Uh, but at least that is a possibility that will happen and perhaps even with the courts mm -hmm. there is a little bit of that uh, bargaining chip right. um, between the three issues right. of 370 and actually 370 <laughs> has not been scrapped. Exactly. 370 has been used mm -hmm. to reduce exactly. the impact of 370. Right. In any case 370 had been hollowed out over the decades. Right. So it was more an issue of uh, living up to the promises that have been made right. over the decades right. from 1950 on right. when the Bharatiya Janasang was formed. Right. Right. Even that has not actually been met because 370 still exists. Right. So it's a very ironic situation in very many ways. Right. And <clears throat> finally, so at one level of course the BJP was the party which led this initiative, pushed the agenda. But there was also say support from various corners of the country, the ADMK, some of them of course NDA allies, but some of them not, not so much, so the BJD for instance. So <clears throat> do you think at one level over the years there's also been a failure of especially the regional parties to understand the complexity of the issues involved and even they have actually ended up seeing the whole issue through this prism? Well, nationalism is the flavour of the day. Right. And a lot of them have also seen the writing on the wall in right. those terms. Mm -hmm. It's the flavor of the day, not only in India, but in international terms in many, many countries. Right, right, right. Um, so uh, it is there in Turkey, it's there in Hungary, it's there in uh, even places like Holland, which one uh, never expected. It's right. there in the US. Uh, so <coughs> Brexit uh, is uh, an aspect of that. So that is something that all of us need to understand a little more. Mm -hmm. As far as the regional parties are concerned, I, f I wish they would take far more seriously mm -hmm. the challenge to federalism exactly. that has emanated from the way mm -hmm. in which a state which had special powers, mm -hmm. which in fact uh, until uh, about uh, 55 years ago right. uh, had uh, in 1964, the beginning of 1964, the state had a prime minister. Right. And uh, a Wazir-e-Azam, right. oh, sorry, Wazir-e-Azam is the same, but a Sadr-e-Riyasam. Yeah. 
this has been reduced now to two union territories. Right. So the lesson that that has for what could be done mm -hmm. with other states, you know, for example, um, Naxalite affected uh, parts of, let's say, Telangana or uh, Chhattisgarh or Odisha could also be uh, under this rubric of right. uh, dealing with uh, terrorism and other such challenges might be uh, also in future uh, open to the same kind of right. uh, possibility. Right. So therefore, this, this uh, challenge to federalism and the way in which uh, a full-fledged state mm -hmm which actually uh, acceded to India under special terms, special right. conditions, right. under the Maharaja's own covering letter. Mm -hmm. It is true that the uh, instrument of accession itself was standard. It was a pro forma, the same as all the other 560 right. or so um, instruments of accession. But the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir gave a very um, uh, significantly worded uh, led, uh, covering letter along with that, with conditions. Then the kinds of promises that were made over the years, whether verbally or in terms of agreements, right. uh, like the New Delhi Agreement of 1952, uh, all of this needs to be taken into account while assessing what has been done and seeing the lessons that it holds right. for federalism right. and the future of federalism. Thank you so much, David. You're most welcome. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching NewsClick.